We will begin, though, in France, where both cinema and arguably science fiction began by looking at Le Voyage dans la Lune, or A Trip to the Moon, if you're going to insist on English translations in this English language podcast. <laughs> the seminal short film by Georges Méliès, based on, amongst other things, Jules Verne's 1865 novel From the Earth to the Moon. There's not a lot to say about it, I suppose. It is only about 50 minutes long, but it would be remiss of us not to bring it up in a discussion on classic science fiction films, and it should absolutely be seen, if for nothing other than historical interest. A story of a group of astronomers who travel to the moon, escape from some lunar inhabitants, and then return to Earth with a captive, is a brilliant example of the inventiveness of the earliest days of cinema, which was then a brand new art form. Melies was a genius, and the special effects and editing techniques were groundbreaking in their time, but it also, in opposition to much of its contemporaries, put an emphasis on narrative, which coupled with high production value, again, for its time, <laughs> and unusual length, for its time, helped to change the direction of cinema. There's also a meta story, with its unauthorised release by other studios, particularly in the US, pirating, I believe that's called, <laughs> oh the irony, from which he saw not a penny, leading to the diminution of his career. Melius himself wasn't forgotten, with the likes of Martin Scorsese's Hugo and the final episode of From the Earth to the Moon paying tribute to him, and his grave in Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris still being visited by pilgrims, including yours truly, full of the resting places of so many great artists, engineers, writers and politicians, Melies's tomb was the thing I desired to see most and few filmmakers have created any single scene quite so iconic as the rocket landing in the eye of the man in the moon. And now that I've talked for probably longer than the running time of the entire film, I'll let Scott speak. Yes, but I don't know if I've got all that much else to say about uh, uh, Voice to the Moon, other than it's it's nice to see it. It's certainly a lot better than the previous state of the art, which I believe was train coming into the screen. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably terrifying. Like. Yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, just echo whatever you say, there's an interest, uh, a vital stepping point in sort of the evolution of film as an art form into something that could actually tell a story rather than just show you a train. And um, yes, on, on that regard, must be, be applauded. And yeah, special effects, obviously, very primitive at the time, but yeah, it still work. Um, and there's something about the fact that you're just using practical effects because, well, th that's all you've got. Yes. <laughs> and that still actually gives a, a degree of physicality that makes it somewhat convincing. In, in certain regards, um, yes, it's, it's not going to convince anyone that we actually went to the moon. Um, but yes, it's a fun little wheeze of a tale, a nice little fairy story, and it's a very interesting thing to watch indeed uh, from uh, this time 118 years, 119 coming up for. 119 years, yeah. yes. So, yes, well worth watching, and it certainly is not going to take up very much of your time to do so. So, do it, do it. No, um, yeah, it's one of those things you've just, you should see. Right? You can't, there's not a lot to talk about because it's not. Um, it's 50 minutes long, um, yeah. and I, I'm struck with just like how remarkable the rate of progress was in early cinema. Because 1902, people are commending *Le Voyage dans la Lune* to for like its uncommon length, <laughs> and like then you get to *Birth of a Nation*, which generally prefer not to talk about, but like only 14 years later. Which is more than three hours long. Yes, <laughs> that's a, a a rather fast rate of progress. Um, I think you must agree. Absolutely. Uh, and what's remarkable to I thought well, there's a at the beginning of the restoration, there's a bit of information about how it was lost. It was discovered again in a film repository in Catalonia, and how it was restored and things like. And they mentioned like that it was all hand coloured. Mm -hmm. Which I think that maybe a lot of people don't know. Like you see old black and white shorts, but when they were originally projected, uh, they were coloured, mm. like kind of fairly crudely, because you can't spend a lot of time, like you know, trying to get out of the flesh looking accurate. Or something. But they weren't shown in black and white; they were shown in colour. But the colouring was all done by hand in post production, and yeah, it's only fifteen minutes long, and it only runs at fourteen frames per second. Yeah, uh, but. That's 13,345 or something frames yeah. individually hand-coloured. Yeah. That's mind-boggling <laughs> and impossibly tedious, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, uh, we can't talk about classic science fiction without talking about that because, you know, it's it's a starting place for so much that was to come. Yeah. 
And just before we move on to our next film, Scott, I wanted to ask, how many of these films had you seen before? Because that's generally one of the things we're looking to do is to find new stuff. And of these, I had only previously seen one. I think I'm about the same. I'd, I think I'd only seen one of these, maybe two. I thought I'd seen two, but I'm not convinced having rewatched it again. Or if I did see it, I'd pretty much forgotten everything that happened. <laughs> so yes, not that many of them. That doesn't matter. I suppose that's more just my curiosity. But uh, so we're largely coming to these fresh then. Mm-hmm. Right. So 